the last time you were here on, on, on stage in FT1, you were talking about the death of cinema and, um, and, and sort of where, the, where cinema was going. I mean, is that something that was just purely a kind of provocation on your part? And Because, I mean, you're still making films, and that's still very much where your future is, in a sense. And there's no sense of that sort of Well, yes. I mean, OK, it is a provocation based upon the notion that unless you think a thing is broken, you're not going to struggle to remake it. And I do think, I'm sure every single person in this audience, even if you're all nostalgics for Casablanca, certainly realizes that cinema is changing, changing very, very rapidly. Uh, my adopted home now is uh, Amsterdam, and basically young people just don't go to cinema anymore. Mind you, they hardly look at broadcast uh, um, television anymore. There's a way that, you know, we're certainly in the age of the screen, but I don't think we're in the age of the age of cinema as our fathers and forefathers would have understood it. I mean, my God, you know, even, even Mr. Tarantino, even Mr. Tarantino now says that cinema's dead. I mean, Goddard's been saying that cinema's dead since about 1985. <laughs> and even I don't go back that far. I started saying it about 1990. But I, you know, I have a whole series of arguments, you know, which of course, highly, highly challengeable. But I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, cinema, what, can we say cinema was created? as a medium of cheap entertainment for the proletariat, but there's no proletariat anymore. We're all bourgeois, so that excuse has all gone by the board. But I mean, our sophistications to play and to maneuver around all the other forms of entertainment are very, very sophisticated now. So I think that um, you know, cinema has minimized its activity in our lives. You know, the old days when uh, Humphrey Bogart lit a cigarette in the cinema, sorry, you can't smoke, but everybody else, you know, that sort of, phenomenon how we copied and parried and were deeply deeply influenced by what happened in cinema practice i think that's gone that's gone that's gone when you introduced the film you kind of referred yourself perhaps slightly tongue-in-cheek as being goldsius could you just maybe elaborate on that a little bit more well as you watch this film you can see i mean my criticisms about actors uh, my criticisms about dramaturges i mean that's me talking of course but uh, I can't really ever remotely imagine that maybe Goltzius did that. But I'm making an identification there. You know, he's working in a mass medium. He's working in the first sort of, I suppose, universal mass medium that produces hundreds and hundreds of prints. Uh, what does he say? I have to maintain and market. He's a businessman. And there are lots and lots of parallels, I think, all the time between him as a mass purveyor of visual communication. Sounds pompous, doesn't it? So, you know, a film director supposedly does the self same thing. And there is, it is historically true that uh, from a very young age that Goldsius always wanted to be a painter. He had a lot of financial troubles with his family and he was sort of obliged to try, if he was going to play and maneuver with visual imagery, he needed to make some money. And the whole burgeoning new beginnings of using the printing press is not for text anymore, but for image was just beginning. So he very, very quickly got into that area. And there's all these sorts of other anecdotes. When he was three years old, he fell into a fire and burnt his right hand. Just at Sotheby's a couple of weeks ago, they, this is a print of Goltz's right hand went up for sale, I don't know, about three or four million. Uh, but it, it was a demonstration of how his hand uh, had been incapacitated by his childhood accident. And there is a suggestion that said, OK, my hand is damaged, but I'm certainly going to do something with it. And a, a lot of people, you know, Rembrandt included, uh, suggested that Goltzius' ability with the Buren, the engraving tool, was absolutely second to none. So in a sense, he overcame his handicap to deliberately uh, make a demonstration that even with a wounded hand, he could certainly, not only for himself, but also for his family, become a very, very rich man. And he did. He did. In 10 years, I think his prints were um, sold all over Europe. There were very big print markets in Antwerp, in Bruges, in Rotterdam, and more latterly, Amsterdam. And it, uh, he did, by the, by, the, you know, by the circumstances of the time, become quite rich. <coughs> And you, you touched on in the introduction as well about this kind of relationship between, well, sex, basically, and pretty much every new innovation that comes in, every new technology, and the printing press, like oil paintings and um, film and photo photography at, at their time. And so, in, in a sense, what you, 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 you're, you're very making this a very modern tale, in a sense, I guess, by bringing it with, with the new technologies we're embracing at the moment. True, true. Yeah, I think, you know, just running our, ourselves through that journey, uh, the invention of oil paint, most painting before about sort of 1450 was uh, basically fresco on walls, very public. 
But with the advent of uh, oil painting, there was a way you could suddenly become very private. You know, you could paint on a panel or a canvas and you could hide it in your bedroom. And if you look at Venetian painting around about sort of 1520, 1530, people like uh, Titian, the Bellinis, Tintoretto, they were beginning to paint nudes in a very, very fulsome display. Uh, those beautiful, beautiful nudes indeed by Giorgione, they, I mean, they could stand in for Playboy centerfolds, but because we've elevated them and they're hanging in the Uffizi or the Brera or whatever, they somehow partake of a different sort of cultural milieu. But don't let's kid ourselves. So that was a way in which a new, a new, a new technology, the new privatizing technology of oil paint allowed that to happen. And again, as you say, you know, skipping all the way forward to... Um, well, the beginning of the 19th century, the beginnings, the early adventures in, in photography, masses and masses of erotica. Again, it happened in 1895 at the beginning of the cinema, and we don't have to talk about it now, do we? The internet, you know, is, uh, makes all that stuff highly, highly um, possible. And if you trace a line between all these events, you can see something happening, too. You can imagine that, um, let's say, Titian was painting a nude. It could conceivably have come out of his imagination, so there doesn't have to be an original naked person there. But as soon as you jump to photography, of course, there presumably has to be. So it comes close to you. The intimacy is greater. And then when you start moving those photographs to make cinema, then it's the actual original nude is moving. And now the sort of manipulations, which virtually, you know, contain temperature and humidity on second life, then it gets closer and closer and closer. Of course sex sells, and what would be very hypocritical not to say that, but these printing presses, you know, Microsoft, are all expensive to set up. So um, there was a way that uh, I think our fascination with sex, which will never go away and will never die and affects everybody from serial killers to nuns, uh, you know, it affects the, celibate, the celibacy as much as the non-celibates. It will always be a guaranteeable fascination for us. So we're always going to be interested in any new technology, which in a curious way brings it more and more and more personal. You've lived away from the UK for a couple of decades, but does it surprise you, this kind of British preoccupation with the nudity in your films and nudity in general in terms of the way that we kind of classify that against them and the fact that there is always this kind of mention about when you're making a film, it's always about the nudity in it that True. people preoccupy. No, I mean, I think, you know, so far the press I've read have been very favourable here in the last couple of days and I'm pleased about that. But it's a question that always comes up, but it never comes up when I, you know, issue a film in Italy. It hardly mm -hmm. ever comes up when I do it in France. And, you know, Russia or, or Eastern Europe, no problem whatsoever. So it does seem to be a bit of... I don't know, a sort of English preoccupation, as though you, never, you don't have bodies. Do you all have bodies? <laughs> How important to you is kind of historical accuracy when you're writing a script and when you're making a film? Well, I would argue there's no such thing as history. There's only historians. You know, every single piece of our history is very subjectively undertaken. And I think basically every generation remakes the history to suit themselves. You know, the classic work of English history is Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But that's not really about the Roman Empire. It's about the British Empire. So historians always, you know, personalize, subjectivize, create the circumstances of a perspective of history relative to their own time and place. I mean, in, in, in the film that we've just watched now, obviously on one hand there's this kind of desire to recreate um, a sort of historical setting, but it's very clearly not in a historical setting in terms of you know, the actual kind of the, the, the whole environment, so to speak, in terms of it's quite a 20th century environment. I mean, is that a conscious thing or is that... Where well, you know, uh, we must all know how peculiar the historical film is and how it completely blasts apart the suspension of disbelief. Uh, when Elizabeth Taylor plays Cleopatra, heaven forbid, you know she's probably wearing Marks and Spencer's underwear underneath. <laughs> I mean, just to look at Elizabeth Taylor's face, you know, she's wearing very 19, what is it, late 1950s lipstick. Even the way the clothes are sewn is somehow completely wrong. We, we accept, I suppose, these vagaries in order, in a sense, to go along with how the film director wants to you know, empower our imagination. But time and time and time again, you know, even, even sort of commercial films which I highly respect, like, for example, Gladiator, is full of the most extraordinary anachronisms and strangenesses. But if the film is made very well and you're prepared to suspend disbelief, then it's successful, we go along with it. So what's happening here, I want to play with all those tropes and paradigms of the artificiality of the notion, indeed, of the historical film. 
One of the games that might have struck you as a little strange was the accent of the central character. It's actually in Dutch called Charcoal Dutch. Uh, charcoal in Dutch also means black coal. And around about 1600, the Dutch didn't have any coal, and they imported all their coal from Newcastle. So what's happening here, it's English spoken with a Newcastle accent in 1600. Uh, that sounds really sort of um, you know, complicated, <laughs> but it, it gives another sort of uh, layer and an understanding that, hey, look, the costumes are different, the properties are different, uh, the thoughts are different, but let's make the language different too. And can you just tell us about the casting for Goetzius? Because he's, he's quite a well-known figure in, in Holland, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually Palestinian by origin, which is uh, rather interesting because the guy who indeed plays the Maghreb is from the Lebanon. And that produced, as you can imagine, when I took the film to Tel Aviv, there are all sorts of awkward questions going on. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, his, ra his name is Ramzi Nazir, and uh, he's, he's now got, a, I, think he's got a, I think he's got a Flemish passport, but he lives in Amsterdam. And he has, for the last three years, been the Dutch Poet Laureate. So he was certainly and thankfully chosen because he's a person who's really interested in words and the manipulation of sounds and so on and so on and so on. I hardly let anybody, certainly any actor, tamper with my script. But um, there was a way I certainly gave him because he obviously knew what he was talking about. You know, he's a poet, he's a literati. He um, you know, had a great sort of uh, belief in the actual, should we say, literary substance of the film. It's quite a risk, though, isn't it, when you choose as an actor somebody who that isn't his sort of you know his first profession. And I know I always get the impression you have a kind of a fairly sort of mixed relationship with actors in terms of how you view them, and obviously it's sort of almost like a sort of necessary evil. Well, you, you're suggesting he's dangerous because he might wanted to rewritten the script. You mean? No, no. Well, th 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 there is that, but also to the fact that he's you know, that he's not somebody who is a kind of known quantity. True. I mean, obviously it, it paid off, but th but that is yeah. a risk, isn't it? I mean, what do you have to work with him quite a lot beforehand? Or? Well, no, a very intelligent guy, and obviously understood the business of writing. Even if you're writing scripts or writing poetry, there's obviously you know, uh, areas of shared experience in that. So I don't think there was any downside whatsoever in it at all. You might notice, you know, we play in the very, very first scene of the film, he has this mutilated hand. Uh, and he was very, very anxious to keep that going. So I don't think you ever see his right hand in the whole of the film. It's always wrapped up in a glove. And apparently he even went to bed with his hand in that's his glove to make sure that it was really good in character. And I don't know whether this is a you thing or whether this is a, a sort of case Cassandra thing, but how important is it to have something like F. Murray Abraham or a name that people recognise in, in, in the films? Is that, is, that, is that a kind of a production thing that is a requirement? No, I think, you know, it, it, this is often works out very strange. And, you know, I, I, I would like you to believe I was being honest, but uh, Murray Abraham's was a very, very last minute choice. I think he only knew he was going to do the part about three weeks before we turned over the camera. Um, uh, he, he's, uh, he's very busy on the New York stage, and I think he had a gap in his schedule. Apparently, somebody told me he was always a considerable admirer of Greenaway films, and we sent him the script not thinking anything would happen, but he was entertained by the character. There are, aren't there, parts of the character here which takes us back to Salieri and, um, and Amadez. Um, I think he's quite used to, you know, it's this, the part he plays is well within his comfort zone. We're not asking him to play, you know, yeah. a good virgin, for example. Um, so uh, he enjoyed it. He's a great Shakespearean fan. Goltz is almost as exactly the same dates as, uh, as Shakespeare. So he felt, you know, in terms of linguistic territory, he was at home. Um, it's been suggested, I don't know whether this, is, whether this is your suggestion or not, but this is the second part of a, a sort of a, a trilogy. I mean, with Nightwatch mm. being the first part, is that something consciously, or is that just a, sort of a convenience now? To I, think, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a producer's trope, I think. You know, things sell well in threes, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, when I started making Nightwatching, I had no idea that we would be making Goltzius, but as it turns out, one of the films coming up is on Hieronymus Bosch, but that is because uh, the whole of Holland will be celebrating Bosch's death uh, 500 years in 2016. But I'm actually making an opera with Philip Glass about Hieronymus Bosch, but alongside that, we will also be making a film as well. I think Bosch particularly interests me because his, his imagery is so strange and so weird, 
And so I suppose anti-clerical, one wonders what are, the, you know, what are the reasons he behaved like that. And perhaps many people might know my great anxieties are about text versus image, image versus text. And I have this theory, I think I'm not completely alone in this, but all the attempts of uh, Bosch to make extraordinary figures are his attempt to turn uh, proverbs and sayings of around about, I suppose, 1500, maybe a bit earlier, into visual terms. Uh, you know, all those proverbs we're very, very familiar with. Uh, there used to be a lot more at a time when most people didn't read, and vernacular language, conceivably, was incredibly rich. And so what uh, Bosch wanted to do was to talk directly to the people by making an image of their everyday speech. Sometimes it's difficult to know whether what you're saying is you know, exactly, I mean, I don't know whether it's what you're feeling at the moment or whether you are just looking for a response. I mean, recently you made some remark about how filmmaking was a silly business, you were going to give it up, you wanted to go and do something that was more worthwhile, go back to painting, but then you're talking with quite a lot of excitement about these projects that are coming up. Like, well, I think one of your questions was, just, and I, I'm sure you were provoking too, but that's okay, <laughs> um, was that, you know, I decry the notion, or I pronounce, make pronouncements about the death of cinema, but I still go on making it. Well, let's put aside the idea that the most interesting people are always full of contradictions. There is a way I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy making films. I really enjoy the exercise. I enjoy, love writing the scripts, and really get excited about writing the dialogue. And then the possibility of making the image to fit the circumstances fills me with uh, enormous amounts of, you know, really excitement. And I basically work with the same set of people, so they sort of double think me. In fact, sometimes when I try and do something completely different, say, no, no, you can't do that. Greenaway doesn't do that. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so that has to be resisted because we can't keep on repeating ourselves absolutely the same every single time. But I have a brilliant, and you can see it, DOP, Director of Photography, makes the most luscious images. And he's a real deep understanding of really uh, contemporary cinematography. Uh, he's right up there. You know, he's, he's uh, highly prized in America, but he refuses to go and work there. So he's always given the most up-to-date camera to, to practice on or to play with. So in a sense, often our camera department, we're sort of guinea pigs for somebody else's experiment with a brand new lens, for example, which is great for me, because yeah. it opens up all sorts of new possibilities, you know, so we feel ahead of the game. And then I'm trained in the British film industry as an editor. I don't, those are the days of uh, editing film, but there are many, many more people, most of them aged about 21 now, who are far, far, far more expert at editing than me, but I work with some brilliant, brilliant editors. So I lean very much on the cinematography, the evidence is there, and you can see how highly, highly edited this film is. Not simply in a cut and paste way, but with this layering, this multi-layering and so on. So it's a question, I think, with who you work with that give you the encouragement, you know, to be able to take all sorts of risks and to experiment. You were given a BAFTA award uh, for outstanding contribution to British cinema. And you did look, I have to say, a little, perhaps uncomfortable actually, slightly <laughs> bemused, slightly uh, surprised to be kind of taken into the fold as a sort of outsider into what is kind of perceived as quite an establishment kind of organisation. And I wonder if you could just yeah. share a little bit about your feelings about that. Well, I felt so hypocritical. You know, they were giving me, you know, was it, is it David Hockney said, you know, in England, if you reach your 70th birthday and you can still <laughs> boil an egg, you know, watch out as they'll pin a medal on you <laughs> just for having sort of existed that long. You know, I've been slamming the establishment cinema and feeling very, you know, discouraged by the state of cinema and its, you know, its text-based nature and its non visual apparatus and its determination to always be about plots and stories and I profoundly think that cinema is not a very good narrative medium. And here I had the audacity to come up and receive, you know, it was really biting the hand of those people, you know, that already would have a contrary opinion. So I did feel very awkward there. Uh, it did occur to me, and certain people said to me, you know, you ought to refuse this. You've been shouting at the establishment for so long. How can you possibly accept a reward from them? But then other people maybe said, well, you know, that's, you know, that's all water under the bridge. Most people believe, like you all do, that cinema's dead anyway now, so we're all part of the same family. <laughs>